I always have a little trepidation when I'm about to launch into the story. It's one of those things, it's kind of like jumping off a cliff, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm always glad after I did it. <laughs> Unlike jumping off a cliff. <laughs> so are we ready? Yes. yes. Okay. Ben, my partner in crime, is, are you ready? Well, I might be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take our chances, I guess. <laughs> So this story was from long ago, in a time that is not our time. In that time, in that time, great joy and jubilation might have been followed very closely by great grief and sorrow. In that time, long ago in that time, a mother's blessing and a mother's curse might be uttered with the same breath. That's how it was in that time. And in that time, there was a land that was ruled over by a count and a countess. Now things were peaceful and prosperous in that land. Things were going pretty well. However, there was one thing that bothered people. Though the Count and Countess had been married for many years, they had yet to produce an offspring. And the people feared that the land would be left without an heir, without a leader. And the people knew that was a dangerous condition in which to live. And just about the time that the people had given up hope that the Count and Countess would ever produce an heir. In the twelfth year of their marriage, the Countess gave birth to a fine, healthy baby boy. And there was great celebration in the land. But the celebration was short-lived. For shortly after the birth, the Countess became sick, and she died. Now before she died, she called the count and all the court to her sickbed. And she extracted from them a promise. She made them promise that they would never allow the young count, her son's feet, to touch the earth. For she said she had it on good authority, whether it was a dream or a vision or an omen or some other kind of knowledge, I don't know. But she swore that she knew that if the young count's feet ever touched the earth, that a powerful old fairy would snatch him away. And as it was her dying wish, the count, and indeed the whole court, promised to honor that wish. Now, the young count, being a newborn, it wasn't very hard to keep his feet off the earth. He was easy to carry around. But as that boy grew, they had to take more extraordinary measures. And a strange kind of chair that could be carried about by a couple of men was devised and built for him. And he would be carried around the court from place to place where he had to go in that chair, in that sedan chair. As the boy grew, however, the court physicians worried that he wasn't getting the proper kind of exercise, being carried about all the time. And they suggested that the young boy be taught the art of horsemanship, be taught to ride. And this was done. A horse, horses were provided. The boy was taught to ride. And he loved riding. And soon, that boy was riding every day. He loved the feel of the powerful animal underneath him, driving across the earth that he could not touch. But wherever he went, whenever he went riding, outriders were assigned to go with him to make sure that under no circumstance could he fall off that horse 
and touched the earth. And that's how it was. And time went on, the boy grew. Every day he would go out riding, and eventually, eventually he learned to hunt from horseback. And he loved doing that. He would go out hunting, but always again with the outriders and attendants spotting him to make sure that in no way could he fall off that horse. And after some years, that boy grew to become a young man. And after so much time, people kept up the process of keeping his feet from the ground more out of habit than out of real fear of some old fairy that they'd heard about. And that's how that was. So this young man, you can imagine, some of you were young men once. Some of you may have ridden horses. Some of you had maybe even gone hunting when you were young, and the exuberance of being on the hunt from horseback. Can you imagine what that was like? And one day, this young man with his retainers, with his outriders, went on a ride. And he had heard of, but had never been to, the place that his father, long ago, used to love to go hunting. It was some distance away from the, the place that he was born, the place that he lived. And so he began the journey. He knew generally the way. And he rode. And he rode hard. And the retainers rode hard to try to keep up with him. And finally, he came through a narrow valley. And it opened up into a small forest. And there was a stream that went through. It was beautiful. There were flowers. The trees in the distance grew tall. The grass was green and lush. All along the stream that went through this, this glade, through this wide place in the mountains, there were bushes and shrubs. There were berries. And as he neared the river, this small river, this creek, he paused for a moment. And as he did, he noticed all the little things, the insects that were flying, his attention was acute. And so he spurred his horse on all of a sudden, and the retainers, they were caught in the beauty also, and they let him get a little bit ahead. And as he began trotting forward, out from the bushes near the creek, leapt a rabbit, a hare. And we know what hares do, they are fast. And the hare, startled by the horse, raced off in front of the young man, in front of that young count. And instinct took over, and he spurred his horse and leapt after that hare. And the hare ran this way and that, zigzag here, zigzag there, went in and around the small trees. And the young count followed, without breaking his step, breathing hard with his horse. He made every single turn following that hare, and just as he was ready to take the shot with his bow, the strap on his saddle broke. <clears throat> and he went this way, and his horse went that way, and he spun through the air. The grace of that fall was astounding. And the retainers could see him just a little ways away from them. And they raced forward to try to catch him before he touched the ground. But no. One hand hit the grass. An elbow. It was timeless. You can see the roll in your mind. Hand, elbow, shoulder, back, hips, feet. And he was gone. The retainers raced through the spot where he had existed one moment before, but there was no young count to be seen. 
And in a terrible freight, they went this way, and they went that way, and they circled, and they looked in the bushes, and they looked in the trees, they dug in the soil, they went everywhere. They were distraught and terrified and horrified and mystified. And the memory of the old countess who had passed away so many years ago, the warning that she had given about the old fairy who was waiting to take the young count, the instant that his feet touched the ground came flaring up in their memories and they surged even harder, but to no fail. And soon, the sun went down and in the dark, with heavy, heavy hearts, they made their way back to the old count, the father, and told him everything that had transpired. And the old count leapt up, breath rising up in his chest. Feet dropped flat back on the ground, heels touched the earth. And the breath came out slowly. And the grief from way down deep in his belly rose up and he cried. And he wept. And the following day, he sent out his retainers to search yet again. For three days, they searched all around every valley, even the places that he couldn't have been, just in the possibility and the hopes that he would be found. But no. And finally, the old count went back to his rooms. And he sat down in profound grief and began to wait patiently in solitude, hoping that one day his son might be rescued. So the instant that this young man touched the ground with his feet, the world changed. Everything that he knew disappeared in that moment. Gone. All the beauty of that field that he was in, the flowers and the bees and the insects, his friends, the, the retainers who had been with him were gone. The sky was different. And he found himself in that instant in the presence of an old fairy. I'm going to let your imaginations hold what that fairy might look like. Mm -hmm. And she took hold of him by the nape of the neck and she began leading him down a path. And as she did, he could see in the distance a great shining lake that was absolutely still. And inside that lake, rising up, was a castle, a strange-looking castle. It had dark ramparts. And leading up to that castle was a weird bridge. The bridge looked as though it was made of clouds. It was a line of clouds that wended its way over the water. Off to one side of the castle, you could see a point coming out, and stones on that point. For no strange reason he could ascertain. And when he looked across the lake, he could see a forest, and the forest was dark and quiet. There was no sound, there was no indication that there was any light in that forest other than the dark green. There were no animals, there was no birds, there were no insects. And behind the forest was a mountain range. <clears throat> And through the mountains and down through the forest, there was fog that waved its way around. And in the distance, he could see a pathway waking its way through the mountains, bordered by stone. And way, way off in the distance at the end of that pathway through the mountains, he could see a river. Just a river. And it was gloomy. And it was mysterious. And it was frightening. And the old fairy whisked him across that cloud bridge. The 
fog lifting up underneath his feet. He could barely even see what was going on around him. And inside the castle, she took him to a great room. And inside that great room, she sat him down and she said, You are to follow all of my instructions without fail and hastily. <clears throat> and if you don't, your punishment will be severe. Your first task for this day, she didn't give him any time to rest. This first task for your day is to go across the cloud bridge there into that forest and cut down all of the trees. You have one day. And the tool that you're going to use is this. And she handed me a hatchet made of glass. <laughs> it had shimmering, dark shape to a beautiful form. Razor edge on that glass hatchet. She put it in his hands. She turned him around and gave him a little shove on the back of his shoulder. And off he went stumbling towards that cloud bridge. And when he put his feet down, remember this is a young man whose feet have never touched the ground before. This. When he put his feet onto that cloud bridge, his feet began to sink in. And terror rose up. Terror took hold of his nuts and worked their way up into his belly and into his breast. But he was... He was committed. He was not going to put up with the torture that he knew that that old fairy would give him. So he took another step and his foot sank. And another step and his foot sank. And so he did. He made his way across that bridge until finally he reached the other side exhausted. But he was resolute. So he made his way up to the first tree in the forest. It was a dark forest. It was a dark, quiet forest. He rushed bark on all of the trees. And he lifted the hatchet looks over his shoulder. He never cut anything before. But he figured a sharp edge. That would work. And he took a mighty swing. Put his shoulders into it. Big twist. And when he hit that tree, something terrible happened. That hatchet shattered into a thousand pieces and fell to the ground right at his feet. And all he was left with was a handle. With no hatchet. He looked at his condition, his situation, the shards of glass at his feet, and he began to water, wander, terrified. He went this way, he went that way. <clears throat> Finally, so exhausted, he sat down next to a tree, put his hands in his, his face in his mouth, and he wept. Until finally, he fell asleep. And he slept the sleep of the dead. Dreams. Until there was a moment inside of his sleeping, something niggled, something interrupted. And he opened his eyes. And when he did, he looked up and he saw a dark maid. Now, what the old fairy had said earlier was, do not under any circumstances speak to anybody that you see in the forest. Do your job and only your job. And so knowing that the dark fairy did not want him to speak to the mage, he held his counsel. He kept his mouth shut. And she was down at him. Now she was an apparition, for sure. And she spoke to him kindly. And she asked him, are you here? Are you here at the, in the, under the spell of the old fairy that's in that castle over there? And something in the kindness of her voice awakened in him. And he nodded. He didn't speak to her, but he nodded. And she sat back and said, me too. Well, the old fairy has me uh, in this condition. And I'm doomed to be here too and so maybe some young person would come along and help me get out of this place. <coughs> and the young man looked up at her something came up in his voice. 
and he started to speak. And he told her everything that had happened. He gave her the details of his life. And when he had finished, she looked at him and she said the same thing. You know, well, it turns out that the old fairy is my mother. And she's cursed me to be here in silence with nobody to save me. And the only way that I can be saved is if I'm carried, carried across the river way out in the distance. See, that river is the border of her power. And if we can swim across that river, then maybe we can have a life together. And the young man, something in that conversation took part, and he agreed. And so she extracted a promise from him. She asked him, will you promise that if I do this work that you're, that you're tasked to do, if I take care of things, will you promise to help me across that river? And he promised. <coughs> and so she took out a little pot, made a little fire, cooked up a little pot of tea, and she gave him and he slipped on it, and when he slipped on that tea, he slept. And when he woke from his sleep, he looked up and around, the dark maiden was gone. All of the trees were cut <laughs> and laid. And next to him was a fully formed glass hatchet. And so he stood up, took hold of that glass hatchet, and in a sense of exuberance that he hadn't felt since all of the world had changed for him, he made his way back across that cloud bridge, gingerly, mind you. Know, very gingerly. But he made his way back across that cloud bridge until he found his way to the presence of the old fairy. And he presented her with the hatchet. He said that the task had been done. And she looked at him. Her eyebrows were moving. I know some of us have seen an old woman's eyebrows met. Not crazy. And she asked him, did you speak to the dark maiden? And he shook his head no. And she looked at the glass hatchet and said, how is it possible that you could accomplish that task without help? And he just shrugged his shoulders. He had the glass hatchet and all the truth was that. And she kept on quizzing him until finally she realized that there was no way that he was going to give her any more information. And so she grabbed him by the nap of the neck, drug him to a small closet, threw him inside with a little bit of bread, a little bit of water, slammed the door, and there he slept for the night. And in the morning, just at the crack of dawn, the door was whisked open. And she drug him out. And she said, for today's task, you shall go back across the cloud bridge, back to the forest that you cut down using the glass hatchet. You are to cut up all of those trees into billets and make piles of them. Nicely split, nicely formed. And you have half a day to do <laughs> And under no circumstances. Are you to speak to anyone, especially the dark maiden, should she appear? So back across the cloud bridge he went, only this time he had some hope in his breath. He had some, something to look for. And so he skipped across that bridge with hardly a notice of how his feet sunk in. No longer did he have the fear that he had the day before. And he made his way to the place where the trees were all cut down. And he stood there looking this way and that. Fear began to come up inside of him because he wondered if he would see the dark man again. And as he was looking, he felt a little tap on his shoulder. And he turned around and there she was. And together they sat and they spoke about their lives just a little bit. And then he explained to her everything that the old fairy had said what the requests were. And the black maiden said, I will take care of things for you. And so she once again knelt down, made a little fire, cooked up on our teapot a little bit of tea, and she handed him some tea. And when he sipped that tea, he went to sleep. And in the, in the time that it took for him to take a nap, he woke 
And there, all of the trees have been cut into villas, nicely split, nicely formed, and nicely piled. And the glass hatchet lay next to me. And no black maiden. So he took up the hatchet, and this time he ran across that cloud bridge. Went back to the dark ferry, went black back to the old ferry there, and he presented the glass hatchet. And once again, she questioned him. How is it possible that you could have done this task in such a short time? Did you have help? He shook his head now. Did you speak to the black maiden that lives in those forests and lives in those hills? And he shook his head no. And she quizzed him further and further until finally she knew that she was going to get no more answers from him. She threw him back in the closet. And there he slept with just a little bit of bread and just a little bit of water until morning and the crack of dawn when the closet door was whisked open once again and the old fairy reached in and grabbed him by the nap of the neck and pulled him out. And she said, four to days pass. You shall go across the cloud bridge to a place where you will see prepared for you are all of the tools necessary and there you will build me a golden castle <laughs> made, and made with silver, gold, and precious gems and make it magnificent. And you have one hour. <laughs> <laughs> and under no circumstances are you to speak to anyone, especially the black man. <clears throat> and so back across the bridge she went, this time with much more hope than he had before. Because he knew there was something special in this relationship. And when he reached the other side, he looked this way and that, and he spied a place on the ground that was flat, and he could see pickaxes and shovels. <coughs> he could see the implements of building laying there in a pile. And next to the flat spot there, he could see nothing else. There was no gold, there was no silver. There were no precious gems with which to build the castle. And as he looked, his heart began to sink because he could not see the black maiden either. And so he looked this way, and he looked that way, and then he heard a little sound. And he looked over a, next to a great boulder, a little bit of distance away, he could see the black maiden peeping around. And so he went over. And he spoke to her, and he explained to her what was required of him. And the black maid he stepped out and said, "You can take care of it." In that moment, the old fairy was on one of the ramparts of her castle, and she was looking down that place with a young count was standing. And she saw a black maiden step out from behind the boulder Oops. and speak to the young count. And as she spied the two of them conversing, some piece of bile <coughs> rose up inside of her. She took a deep breath and she let out a scream. <coughs> and she threw up her cloak, and she began to run. She flew down the stairs, down to the cloud bridge, and if you can imagine a ravening, wild, angry, old fairy, knees pumping across that cloud bridge, the clouds puffing out of the way, furious in her face, teeth showing right down to her gullet, screaming all the way across that bridge <coughs> the two And the dark maiden said only one word to the young count. She said, run. <laughs> <laughs> and they both began to run. They started heading toward that river, far off in the distance, running as fast as their legs would carry them. But it wasn't very long before they could hear the rustling sound of the old fairy's clothes as she ran 
right behind them. She was gaining on them. The young count could almost feel her breath. And he anticipated the feeling of her old bony hand grabbing him by the nape of the neck at any moment. In terror, he ran. Now, the dark maiden, before she took off, had pulled a shard of rock off that boulder that she'd been hiding behind. And at this moment, she spoke words of enchantment and she flung that little piece of rock over her shoulder behind them. And instantly, there sprang up an enormous palace of gold and silver and gemstones. And the old fairy was entranced, was charmed. She had to explore this magnificent castle. And when she went in, she found that all the passageways and all the aisles and all the rooms were laid out in a kind of a maze. So it took her a long time to work her way through that castle and out to the other side. And in that time, the dark maiden and the young count had made their way about halfway to that river. But it wasn't long before the old fairy was once again breathing down their necks. She had closed the distance between them. And so the dark maiden spoke other words of enchantment, and this time she transformed herself into a beautiful little pond. And she transformed the young count into a drake, male duck, swimming, paddling happily in the middle of that pond. Now that pond was enchanted. And the fairy could not go into it. And so she called up a great storm. Lightning bolts came crashing down from the sky, then hurricane forth winds began to blow, and hailstones as large as my fist began to fall by the thousands. But that pond was protected by that enchantment, and none of that storm even caused a ripple on that pond, and that drake paddled happily in the middle of it, quite contentedly and quite calmly. And so the old fairy gave up on the storms. And she decided that she would cause a great pile of sand, a great mountain of sand to rise up and to fill that pond. And, and huge mountains of sand, large dunes began to rise up and to push the pond. But even old and very powerful fairies even they have to give way to the power of water and gravity. And all their efforts just caused the pond to slide closer <coughs> to that river. And so she had to give up on that tactic as well. And then she decided she would call up some nuts, some poisoned nuts, and these she flung into the pond, hoping that the drake would eat one of them and die. But the drake simply paddled around and pushed the nuts with his bill off to the side of the pond, seeming to, to tease or torment the old fairy. And so the old fairy had to withdraw and think of something else. And when she had gone for a while, Back over behind the boulder that the dark maiden and the count had hidden behind, the dark, ma the, the dark maiden disenchanted themselves. She returned them to their human form and they began to run again toward that river. But they didn't get more than a hundred steps when that old fairy was once again right on their heels. And so this time, the dark maiden spoke words of enchantment again. And she transformed herself into an old standing stone temple. And she transformed the young count into a fierce temple guardian, barring the way into the temple. She caused an enchantment to fall over the temple, 
and the temple guardian. <coughs> the old fairy tried to enter the temple, but the guardian prevented her. She pulled out a dagger and tried to stab the temple guardian in the face, but the dagger had no effect. It couldn't reach him. And so the old fairy called up her own medicine. And she caused an earthquake to occur. And the great standing stones began to sway and began to teeter. And the temple guardian began to lose his balance on the shaky ground. And the temple began to collapse. But the old fairy, fearing that the great stones would land on her, would crush her, she had to withdraw a ways back to get out of the way. And when she did that, the dark maiden disenchanted the temple. They resumed their human forms. They began to run, and the dark maiden spoke one more enchantment. She caused a thick forest full of wild beasts, birds, and boars, and bulls, and bears, growling, and snarling, and singing, and chirping. All the things the old fairy hated and feared, all the life she detested, she caused to grow around her. And the old fairy, in fear, cowered, and had to slink her way back out of that living woods and go a right long way around to get back after them. And by that time, the dark maiden and the young count had reached the edge of that river. And that's where we will leave them for now. So we were left with the old fairy caught in that strange wood. The animal sounds and the beasts and the buzzings and the light that she so, so disrupted. That she worked so hard to keep out of her realm. Caught her for just a moment. Just long enough. Just long enough. For the young town and the black maiden to make their way to the edge of the river. If you can imagine a wide river that's moving, it's moving quickly, but it's not rapid. But it is important. The distance is great enough to not really be beckoning for one to try to swim across. However, they know that this river is the boundary of the power of the old fairy. And as they near, this particular river had a unique quality to it. It drew in enchantment and magic and made that magic dissipate. And the black maiden, knowing Stop the two of them. And they had just a few moments before the old fairy would be on them again. And knowing that her moment was right now, her instant of the possibility of transformation was in this moment. For if she got into the river in her current condition, very likely that would be the end of it. And if she did not have the possibility of the promise of a young man coming true, then her life would continue much the same as it had. So she turned to the young man, turned to the young count, and she asked him, is your promise still true? And the young count looked at her, saw her in her current ugly form, knowing what he knew from his time with her during all of the trials that they had been through. He said, yes. So she took a bow and arrow and she handed it to him. She took a bag and she handed it to him and strapped it around his waist. And she reached over and she whispered in his ear instructions. And then she took one step back Another step. She took three or four steps back 
before the land of the old fairy had disappeared. In the instant that she disappeared, a ravening boar emerged with tusks, fire in its eyes, and a loud snort dug up the soil and charged the young cow. It had every indication it would tear his guts out. And the young cow took one step back, pulled an arrow, knocked it, drew, aimed, and fired just before the boar reached it. And his aim was true and pierced the skull of the boar. And the boar hit the ground, digging up the dirt, tusks in the air, mouth And out of the mouth of the boar left a hair. And that hair burst forth hit the ground running, zig this way, zig that way. And in that instant, the young count reached back, pulled another arrow, knocked it, and followed. The zigging and the zagging and the leaping of that hair and at just the right moment, loose. And the arrow, once again, flew through and pinned the hair to the ground. And as that hair was pinned to the ground, up left a white dove that began flying in a circle over the top of the young town, cool. making beautiful sounds, not flying away, but just circling. And the young town took one breath, taking in the beauty of this wondrous bird. And then remembered the instructions that the black maiden had given him to pull his third arrow. And without hesitation, followed the flight of the dove and loose. And with just one small splash of red, that dove flooded to the ground. And the young man walked over to the dove. And as he neared, from the dove in the little egg, rolling towards him. He took his knee and he lifted the egg into his hand. And as he did, he holds this small dove egg. If anybody's seen the dove egg, they know how fragile they are. And he took that dove egg close to his breast, and in the moment that he brought that dove egg close to his breast, out of the clouds came a great vulture with its mouth wide open, its claws hanging open, ready to grab, ready for destruction, ready for the death that vultures feed on. And the young man took one more step back, and as he did, he lifted his arm, the vulture drew near, mouth wide open, and just before he reached him, the young man cast the egg into the gullet of the vulture, right down his throat. When he did that, something miraculous happened. The vulture disappeared, and landing lightly on the ground was the most beautiful woman that he had ever seen, the most beautiful maiden he had ever seen. The dark maiden, the black maiden, stood before him in her true form. And together, they went arm in arm and entered that wide, foreboding river and began to swim across. As this was happening, the old fairy finally made her way through the forest. And she leapt out of those trees onto the shore of the river, and she could see in the distance the two of them swimming across, arm in arm, like fishes gently swimming through the waves. And she called upon her last trick, her last capacity, the last thing that she could do. She called on her two dragon chariot. And out of the sky, flame came down, 
and the chariot landed on the shore. She jumped into the back of the chariot and called on them magically to lift up, and she flew high, and she circled over, and she could see the two swimming in the river, and she flew down, ready to take one of them out, if not both. But if you remember, that river had the quality of drawing magic into it. And so as she came closer to the river, closer to the two, the magic dissipated from the chariot, the dragons disappeared, the chariot, what was left of it hit the water, and a big splash, and she rolled in the water, down the river, bouncing along the bottom, getting pulled this way and that, and she made the way past the two swimming further down the river, completely powerful, until finally she was hung up on some branches of an old down log that hung in. And there she was stuck. And the little fishes began nibbling at her, as they are wont to do. And that's where we will leave the old ferry for the young couple. Finally reached the shore and began making the long journey towards his father's land. And when they neared, the people saw them coming and recognized the young man that they had been carrying around day in and day out for all of those years, <coughs> walking firmly and upright on his two feet and standing next to him, a beautiful maiden. And the call went out. The word made it back to the old count, and the old count finally broke his solitude. And he came. And when he saw the two, he embraced them both. Now, in these wondrous lands, amazing things happen, not the least of which are weddings. And so a wedding was called, all the dancers were gathered. Food was prepared. Musicians tuned their instruments. Singers cleared their voices. And a great celebration happened. And the party went on for two weeks. And a third week. And so it is that we leave these two amazing young people who went on to leave this land taking the good with the bad. Now you know at the wedding banquet there were magnificent bouquets of flowers. And it so happened that a bee was drawn to the scent of those flowers. And while the bee was there going from flower to flower in the bouquet, gathering nectar, gathering pollen, the story that you've just heard was recounted by the young count and the new countess. And the bee took that story back to the hive. The bee danced that story to the whole hive and communicated it to the hive. And the story made the honey that that hive produced especially sweet. And so people, beekeepers, sought those bees over and over again and took them from place to place. And many hundreds of years, perhaps thousands of years later, somebody took the descendants of those bees to an orchard. And they set up shop there. And the bees landed on the apple blossoms. And the story was transmitted to the apples. And so for hundreds of years, those apples became especially sweet and were planted over and over and over again. But one year, in a descendant of that first orchard, nearby there was a swine herd. And you know pigs, if you've ever kept pigs, they're hard to keep track of and they will break through fences. And that's what happened. Some pigs broke <laughs> through the fences and they got into that orchard and they loved gorging themselves on those sweet apples that had fallen down on the trees. And the story went into the pigs. And they carried it and it made the meat especially sweet and so people kept breeding those pigs over and over. 
And the other night, we cooked some pork and tomatillos. <laughs> ben had some, and I had some, Miguel had some, and Jonathan had some, and the story went into us, and now we've told you. All right. Oh. <laughs>